Okay, I think we are up on YouTube. Looking some property upstate now. So. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Enjoy it. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing well. I'm, I'm actually still engaged with the Drift of the Southeast and Caribbean Disaster Recovery Partnership, which is a group of uh, sort of uh, resiliency practitioners, so to speak, people who are in the business of studying and, and educating folks about resilience. Uh, and, um, and that's been a really good exercise. So it's federal, state, local. Uh, um, government folks, but also uh, private sector folks, about 150 people in that group. And um, the other thing I'm doing is, if I may say, is uh, I am involved pretty closely with the South Carolina uh, American Heritage Commission and uh, also the Wood Goja, which is their foundation, and, uh, which is doing work in terms of um, raising awareness of the need to collect the production of resources and places and assets. And, uh,
exactly what the VAR will expect, and it should look extremely like a lot more effective. And then recently, we had great success at our farmers market. We during COVID, especially and high gas prices, we saw we uh, we experienced a gap in volunteers that were able to come and access produce at farmers markets that was still good to eat, but wouldn't uh, make it till the next farmers market. So we have a new uh, we re renewed our partnership with Fields and Families. They've been able to get a lot more volunteers to help, but now we're back at our farmers markets uh, bringing that produce to the community. So that's really exciting. But we all know the food recovery hierarchy food donations were poorly accomplished. And now some notable achievements that our department specifically has been working on. So as you know, we, we uh, implemented the Climate Ambassador Program to help inspire leaders to share more information about our climate action plan with the community. We've had over 30 presentations, reached over a thousand people with what we're doing and what people can do to help. So that's been a great program. It's been all volunteer led. Uh, Stuart has done lots of presentations. Christine has done some, so it's, it's been fabulous. <laughs> um, our Adopt a Drain program, as you know, we created that a while ago. We ex recently expanded that in the past year to include county drains. So uh, we're really excited to say that's now a regional program, and we'll be inviting other jurisdictions to as we uh, finish working out any final things. And then these last three, I'll go into in a little more detail. We all know we started a new composting program, a new mattress recycling program, and the Charleston Rain Food Mini Grant program. Those were all uh, funded their pilot years by grants, so it's really exciting. So now looking to continue those programs and how we do that in our budget. And the lead forward. Yeah. Yep. So before I jump right into uh, the other priorities that we have at an individual agenda, I, I wanted to mention FloodSat because today I will talk a little bit about emissions, but during our FloodSat meetings, this is where we talk in greater detail about emissions and about details of our projects, how we can improve them, what's working in our programs, what's not, what do we need. Uh, so just a quick plug for FloodSat, especially since Tracy's right next to me. Manages it. It's if you don't know what it is, uh, just a reminder: it's our it's our data-driven performance management system that tackles anti-corrosive in the city's top priorities. And floods that specifically focuses on flooding and how the community can be involved. So, if you're interested in that, I will be presenting all that information about my projects uh, at our next meeting, which is the same day as our next meeting of this meeting, but right before at 9:30 in the morning. So that is a public meeting. Anyone is. So our mattress recycling program, we piloted this. We have all the marketing materials. We have everything created. We did take a break in 2022 because we didn't have the funding to continue it. Uh, it's mostly due to COVID implications, really, to our budget. So our 2023 budget request is for $10,000 to continue that program pretty much at the same pace we did it before, which is about 500 pieces, diverts 11 tons from the landfill. That saves us 15,000 cubic feet of space and offsets 15 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. So that, like I said, that program is all created, ready to go, just needs hauling funding. Our Charleston Rainproof Mini Grant Program, similar, so asking for $10,000 here. The uh, program that we piloted, we did a $5,000 program, and we were able to install 23 new rain gardens. This fall, we we're also doing $5,000, and we're aiming for 25, so they're $200 a piece, the $200 Subsidy covers about half the cost to install your own rain garden. So we have some skin in the game to provide all the training. But look at the impact here. So uh, we noticed that nobody would install rain gardens unless we actually incentivize them to do it. We saw actually zero rain gardens installed in 2022 uh, because we didn't provide funding, presumably. So, but we saw people just so excited and interested when we provided them new grants. So again, this fall we already we already have over 40 applications for 25 spots we have a waiting list going so we think we can expand this duplicate this uh next year uh, double it and that look at that uh impact there are one million gallons of uh, water stormwater diverted from the central drainage system annually from the so that five thousand dollars goes pretty far again all that program material is created if you just sort and then finally uh just to talk a little bit more about the compost program so we went over this Great detail at our last meeting. I know I won't uh, duplicate all that comments, but uh, our compost program, we have about a thousand participants right now. We're looking to increase that to 3,000. So, continuing our three current drop sites that are working really well, we've had a lot of success. We received a lot of great feedback from a recent survey this summer. 
and then expand into three new drop sites. And those three new drop sites would help make this a full city program. So getting a drop site on Daniel Island, for example, back to Gus John's Island, uh, and that will really help expand this program. So uh, that's what the 20,000 for, it's for just the hauling for the six sites. We did, uh, council did recently accept a grant award for $12,000 that will cover any new signage we need at the new drop site, will cover any new marketing materials we need created or printed. Uh, but again, we have logos and everything, the program's already created. Uh, I will say these program impacts do not include the potential regional impacts. And I say this with a giant smile on my face because we've already reached out to neighboring jurisdictions to say, hey, we've got this great compost program. Would you like to be part of it? Would you like to host a site? We would just be responsible for your site. You would pay for the hauling on your site. And then together as a, as a region, anyone could drop off their compost at any of the sites. So uh, that really will help expand our program. We'll get more drop sites, and then it won't be completely on the city to pay for it. We'll get sustained need from other jurisdictions. So we already have interest from a few others. I don't want to leave them out for them, but uh, I'll put that out there. That's, that's really exciting that this will become regional as well. So we definitely need the 20,000 to make those with our drop sites going. And then some other priority funding requests. So uh, a, a position in our department that would handle communication and community engagement. Our, this, this position would also focus on resilience, uh, emergency management, and floodplain management. So it encompasses all four topics. This is a position we've been asking for for years that's really important because we, we don't do a good enough job explaining what we are doing with our programs. A lot of people are not familiar with what's actually happening at the city. But more importantly, as we learned in our climate action plan, Remember, only 2% of our emissions citywide are coming from city government. So that means to get the other 98%, we need to go out in the community. We need to talk to people. We need to involve them and inspire them to take climate action too. So that will be a, a big role for this person. Um, now, a second grant manager position, this would not be specifically in the sustainability and village office at all. This, was, uh, this request is being made for VFRC. Just a super plug here because there's just so much federal funding and we have one grant manager and we still have any capacity to apply for these to manage the project or to be managed in compliance for them. So I, I just wanted to put that plug out there. If we want to go after that funding that will really help us, uh, we really need to uh, at least another grant manager. And then a couple other priority projects uh, that need funding to implement the climate action plan are street tree inventory, uh, which I believe is now funded by through ARPA funds. So that's really exciting. Um, we that happen this summer. Our leaf flower transition is made of second growth lengthening. So last fall, we, we took a resolution, we made a resolution and commitment to transition our city leaf blowers and leaves by example. We have about 90 leaf blowers. I'd say about 15% of them are already transitioned to electric, which is pretty exciting. Uh, so we have a few more left. We committed to transition those by summer 2023. So that means all that funding does need to be in the 2023 budget. So you'll see that spread out in the three different departments that have leaf blowers, which are the parks, recreation, and so on. Um, let's see, also uh, operational funding to maintain our existing facilities. This is one thing we hear from parks and facilities all the time. Is, you know, we, we, our funding for operational maintenance is we wait for there to be a hole in the roof and then we have to scramble to figure out how to fix it instead of doing more proactive maintenance that could help prevent that hole in the roof and larger costs down the road. So uh, always in our climate action plan, you know, we're encouraging to make, proactively maintain our city's facilities and existing HVAC equipment to ensure that as efficiently as possible. Also in our, our capital and improvement plan, we have funding to make sure that when we are building our city facilities, to, that those are as resilient and sustainable as possible. You know, not only accounting for sea level rise, but also how can we reduce our carbon footprint when we have renewable energy in these facilities. So those are some items that were in, in the works that we're hoping we'll budget funding to really help with that. And then finally, public services requesting funding for a garbage can audit. Uh, as you know, we, we this this audit will give us data to help us reevaluate our programs, how we collect garbage and trash, how we charge for them. There are some residential homes that have three uh, or more garbage cans in front of their home, and while they may have paid an extra couple dollars for that can, they don't actually pay for the extra hauling. So the process is broken, and there's a way we could use this data to change the way we collect garbage and trash to incentivize more recycling and composting. So those are the priority funding requests. So are there any questions or any bring that for me, Justin? I have a question. I just saw something up there I wasn't familiar with. Um, maybe someone can 
very, or all of us, quick briefing the street tree inventory and the ARPA funding. That's the one. The street tree uh, inventory is something that the Park Department has been wanting to do for a long time. And it's on. Does it include money not just for inventory but for replacement or planting and all that? Or is it just an inventory? I think this part of it is just the inventory, but the, the um, intent is, you know, to, to follow with appropriate. And then, and in a way, it kind of ties in with the heat resiliency study that we've been working with in USC on as well, identifying parts of the city because. Well documented now, places without trees are, are subject to additional heat exposure and quality of life and from a flooding um, point of view, but also um, well well documented. More trees you got the more yeah. water they yeah. soak up. So, so the, the intent of, of the, the inventory certainly is. To serve both right. of those goals. Great for getting some funding guys to put some trees out too. Yeah. yeah, I think one of the challenges the Parks Department relays to me is that it's hard to plant new trees when you don't have a grasp of what your existing tree inventory and needs are. So that data, will, we, while we have tree canopy data from the geometry data, we don't have data on individual trees. So, for example, like where, where do we have live oaks? Where do we have a diversity of species? Where do we have monitor? Because the last thing you want is your whole peninsula to be all live oaks and all the same age and then they die all at the same time, or if there's a disease, they're all gone together. So uh, diversity is key, but to to uh, add new trees and to make sure we're taking care of what we have, we need to know what we have and we don't know. So that's really what the inventory would be. And then with, ideally when urban forestry goes out and trims, they would you know log into the GIS app and say, okay, we just we just trimmed this tree. Now we know how often this tree is in service, if it has any challenges, if we're watching a disease on it, et cetera, et cetera. So that data will be really informative to uh, keep monitoring things. Thank you. Helpful. Any other questions, thoughts, comments? Well, one other thing, Mayor, I think just to brief, because I, I mean, there's so many things that are happening that are positive. I do think keep an eye too on now we're looks like fully funded for the Ashley River Bike Pet Bridge. So a whole piece of information we've done at the city for mobility in something other than your car. So um, mm -hmm. keep an eye on that. That's a really exciting project and I think fits right in with the work that Mr. is just advising the city council on that. Okay. Yeah, good work. <laughs> So um, this is will be presented at the next city council meeting, like maybe so oh, right. everybody is involved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> My question is a protocol more for than anything else. Does this, does this body provide um, body asked to endorse this, these requests or are we receiving this from tonight? <laughs> Um, body can make a recommendation to council uh, based on the. Uh, I'll bring those out to the recommendation. Any discussion about that? I, they're all very modest um, yeah, certainly. line items, and I think given the success and progress we've, we've shown, they're, they're all good at that. All in favor say aye. 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 All right, we'll send it on. Next meeting with the, um, with the station. So, is there any, but let me ask, are, are there any things that um, either we had intended to do with the city that was on the climate action plan and got around to that really needs some attention that you would bring to our attention? Maybe not. Well, it's a five-year plan, so we have five years technically to implement it all. We're in the first year, so we, we know we can't do everything at once. I wouldn't say that there's a top thing we need to focus on right now, but I, I do think we'll dive into that more at what's that. Okay. 
So next up is our strategies for electric vehicle infrastructure, and we talked about that at this seems to be uh, developing day by day um, with, with, with the polls. So, Katie, you want, and Stuart, you all want to give us an update? Yeah, I, I should have mentioned earlier, we have uh, Wesley Westmoreland is on the line in, in the proxy for Danny today, Danny Katz is from Dominion, so he's he's on the phone, I think he's driving Tesla right now. So, um, so if, if he has questions or uh, comments, we could, we could go to him. So uh, I don't want to repeat a lot of things that Wesley said, but I'll, uh, at our last meeting, he gave us a great presentation. But just really quick, we're talking about EV maker and codes right now. So basically, this is about new construction, not existing construction, and setting aside a certain percentage of their required parking to be to have have some type of infrastructure that's ready for electric vehicle parking stations. So this isn't extra parking requirements at all. It's taking existing parking requirements and new construction and retrofitting. Uh, and actually, Hillman in South Carolina is leading the way here. So back in 2015, I think this article said, they started a requiring reconstruction to have at least one electric vehicle station installed for every new, every new development. So 2015. So just really quickly, the market trends we're seeing are showing that we really need gas. So by 2030, we're seeing, uh, we're estimating nearly 30% of registered vehicles will be powered by electric energy. and uh, it's much more difficult to go back and retrofit parking facilities and homes than it is to make that installation up front of the, all the electrical wiring and uh, capacity needed. And uh, oh, we know that over 80% of vehicle parking happens at home or work. So while we're seeing this investment happening nationwide, we're seeing uh, lots of calls from the federal government especially, we're also seeing this in South Carolina right here at home. So over 200 million investment was just recently released in 2021 from, from local companies like Volvo and Blue Gen this year. So right, what are our strategies to increase EV readiness? There are three main strategies. And let's start at the bottom first. I think that's simplest to understand. It's, uh, and Wes even over these two, but basically installing a charging. So it would be the station and all the wiring, everything before it, pay off capacity that you need for that station. The most expensive option. The middle option is we call it more of an EV ready. Um, we're more focused on the outlet. So think of a dryer size outlet. Uh, and you're basically providing the outlet to be able to install a charging station should you want that at a later time. So uh, significantly less cost, but having that hardware infrastructure in place is just paramount. And then EV capable uh, at the top here is the simplest one to do. And this is really just making sure you have a panel capacity dedicated. To you. So as uh, so, so a lot of our older parking garage, for example, do not have panel capacity and transformers capable of more than a couple level two stations and don't have any capability for level three stations for the majority of them. So those are the three strategies we talk about. Now we talk about these in terms of uh, acting on either commercial and multifamily or residential or both. So when we look at single family residential, uh, so think of if, if you had that dryer outlet already in your garage, it would be really easy for you to just purchase a, a station and install it yourself. You wouldn't need an electrician, you wouldn't need to spend thousands of dollars to go back and retrofit. Mm -hmm. The cost to put this dryer plug in is a couple hundred dollars. It's very minimal on this question. Um, I know Stuart has gone through this process, so he can talk more about it when, when he jumps in, but it's just so much more cumbersome to not have that outlet in place. When you're talking about commercial and multifamily, so like, as I mentioned, it's a lot more about electrical capacity not being there. And going back to retrofit, adding conduit, adding new transformers is very expensive. Uh, and that's why the cost to install these stations varies so much because it all depends on the back end infrastructure, what's in place and what's, need, what's needed. So on top of that, we, we know that a lot of people do not own an electric that might want to because they are limited in the way they can park. And this is specifically true if you live in a condo, have an HOA that you report to, or an apartment where the, there's a management authority that oversees that. So if you can imagine a 300 person apartment, if two people would like a, to charge their EV station, you don't, they don't have a lot of power to get that installed. And maybe when the HOA finds out that it's going to cost them 
they can have another case oh and they say you know what we'll wait so that limits people's power so that's also a really big advantage of the ed ready code especially in multi-family uh, because that gives people more options to own these vehicles should they be so when we look at cost, there's actually been a lot of studies on this cost of doing it upfront versus retrofitting. It's very significant, and savings are around 75% to do it upfront. And here's some examples locally. And uh, I sent out a report that Stuart actually worked on to to summarize all these in more detail. But you can see we talked about Hilton Head, one eating cells based on commercial. They did not address single family. Coral Gables, Florida took a tiered approach, which may be something we might like to consider. Consider the EV capable number is the more affordable option, the EV installed is the more expensive. So, uh, but the, I, I think a lot of codes are focusing on at least about 20% of the parking required. And there's there can be minimums to this. You know, we can say only parking if you have over 50 spaces. We, those are all details that we can finagle in the future. Uh, but just looking for a path forward here. So, uh, you see Orlando, Miami Beach, some of these codes are, are older, Atlanta. These codes are older and they're actually looking to go back and retrofit these to add more EV installed requirements. And then you can see Salt Lake City has one installed per 25 spaces. So it's really what 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 we'd like and we really need to do some public outreach and hear from our community members too and developers about what they feel is appropriate. But I thought uh, we could start having that discussion today before we ever started drafting anything to get some ideas from this community. I will say this is an action that's called out in our climate action plan to create a policy to require these stations or EV ready infrastructure, at least in multifamily and commercial, but, and then consider them for single family residential. I'm curious of everyone's thoughts on that. So with that, I will turn it over to Stuart. He has some findings he'd like to share and then open it up for discussion on what y'all feel like should be a next step. And just as an example, we could start drafting the policy and take it back to the community in November to review. <coughs> thank you, Katie. I, I want to thank uh, Jake Leach and, of course, Wes Westerman. Because uh, all, all I did was compile everything that they did. So uh, I, I appreciate their efforts at the beginning. Uh, the strategy that Katie just shared with you from the Climate Action Plan, the original strategy, which was before that one, which became that, was to almost uh, require a 240 outlet in every new single family homes <coughs> in the city of Beverly Charleston, which is, as you said, would reduce the cost by almost 50% of installing uh, EV ready type of uh, processes. Um, but I think the, uh, everything looks, uh, is explained in what we sent out, so I'm not going to go through that. We are in a position, if you went to Mellow Mushroom in the, in the mall, um, and you ask people that were charging their Teslas, and I'm using Tesla because I'm accustomed to that, there, uh, why are you charging here? Because they live in an apartment and they don't have a, a, a charging. Um, if you talk to people, even if you go to Chevy and ask why aren't people buying the Volt, they'll tell you, I have no place to charge it. And we know that you have certain manufacturers who in a couple of years are gonna be only manufacturing EVs. So, Folks, if we want the tourists to keep coming to Charleston, we need to be able to provide uh, opportunities. And as we put in the uh, uh, email that was sent out, well, you want to rent an apartment, you want to buy a house and doesn't have EV capability, uh, are you going to buy to do that? So I think we're going to see a plateau and we need to be ready for what's coming. I thought instead of me going into more detail, we're recommending commercial and multifamily. Part of the conversation today is should we also talk about new residential um, or should we ask zoning to just develop the procedures for commercial and public housing zones? So Let me talk. It'd be interesting to have a robust conversation among everyone here. Okay. Well, John and Rick. I told them, well, Tracy, I wasn't going to cause them trouble. So here we go. <clears throat> when, when do we engage? How is the development community engaged in this conversation? Because I guess for us to be fully part of the online version, we need to use the multiplier. Okay. okay. And this is this is I think providing I think that providing incentives is going to be really important to get this off the ground. But I think this is a good point. Uh, all of those full EV, uh, I mean, they're going to 
So, will the market come around? Is the market is coming around in some respects, as we can see. But what is it, tell me, is that that, what's that balance? Do you have any idea of that? Oh, I, I think you already you're already seeing some restaurants. You want to answer that? Uh, and then you see some restaurants in the city that are presently putting charges on. Whole Foods puts a charger on. Um, you're going to see more and more that the incentive. Uh, I've actually stopped at some traveling where I stopped at a hotel and motel. And the person has said to me, Oh, you go to Tesla? Should I get a charger? I said, Yeah, because you're going to get more people stopping at your hotel or motel because you do have a charger. So it's coming. And, and I think that if you look at some of the other requirements from the city, whether it be the elevation requirements, or some of the new stormwater management requirements, people realize that's important for the city and you know, have to do it. Uh, but here it's going to be, it's, it's all money. Uh, people are going to see, you, you want the tourists, you want the people coming into the city, you're going to need charging signals. I'm just wondering at the more public facilities, you know, cities, counties, state agencies, um, they're also going to have to do this. Um, and they're going to have to find funds to do this. I know um, in the recycling world, the state has laws and regulations that say, you know, when you buy a battery, you pay a little fee, and that helps with electronic recycling. The refrigerator, you pay a little fee, and it helps with you know, recycling that refrigerator, and on and on. So could there be a fee on these cars to help pay for the charger? I don't know if any other state is doing that, um, but it makes sense because this is a statewide issue. It's really a nationwide issue. If we want the people to come here, they're going to be driving here. So, you know, it's not just the drop of the charger. Uh, I, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll address that. Uh, you know, people who drive a hybrid already pay $60 a year because they're not paying gas tax. And people who drive a full EV are paying $120 a year. Because they end up buying the gas tax. So I don't know if that is in that mix, but what I neglected to talk about is the amount of money coming in from the federal government into the state. So the state office of, of um, resilience uh, is responsible for this, and uh, their uh, the state has to, has already submitted to the federal government a proposal to how to study the study. That's what we do in South Carolina, but at least there's something happening. The study had to study how to use all of that money uh, that's going coming in specifically for EV charging throughout the state. So there is at least a state agency working on that, and that could end up, I think, like at least $10 million in the beginning and maybe more each year for the next five years. So it's a significant amount of money coming in. Um, we will be looking at where they're going to be putting those charges. But I think we as a city can set an example of where we can do that. And I think we could probably do that with some companies that won't cost us any money um, in us installing it, but also putting a requirement in for new commercial and new retail. That was kind of getting at my question, which having traveled with friends who have electric vehicles who stop and they pay to charge at charging stations, are those? Are they self-funding, or you know, is there? It seems like that's the new model for charging stations. I, I I don't know of anywhere except if you have your own in your home, which I have. Right. But if I'm on the road and I'm stopping at a supercharger, I'm yeah. charged for that. Right. The, the only people that are not charged for that are the people who own the original original Teslas who had lifetime right. for that car, not for any other car. But you were charged. But it's still. For example, if I charge from um, right now from 20% to 80%, so that's probably about maybe 15 gallons of gas, that's maybe $12 for me. Right. Okay. So, uh, no, so, but do private organ, do private businesses install that? Like, is it always that the the builder would have to install it? And their cost is on them, or are there private companies that install charging stations because they are making money? They're making money doing it. I think that's an interesting point, and it's good for a conversation here without saying one or the other way. If I was a commercial business, I'd want charging stations because I would want that for people to come to my.
my business. Um, and in multifamily homes, if you have, if it's run by an HOA, you might need to put in a way of charging the individuals for their charge. Right, so I think it, it can work both ways. So right now, like at Whole Foods, there's no charge. And so they're using that almost like as an incentive for folks to come and shop there. And uh, we'll see more of that. But I think as the market expands, you'll see more pay for charge uh, facilities. Yeah, that work. Um, but the, the question before us, I, I think, is what we would do as a city in our building code requirements for uh, commercial um, structure, but also whether we in a requirement to huge new building, but new building of uh, single family homes. Now, I was at a chamber meeting just yesterday and uh, they were happily reporting the, the progress on our um, slab, a proposal that we'll be bringing the city council and how we collaborated with the chamber, the home builders and the realtors and involved them all the way through on what some people said was compromised, but everybody's happy with where we're headed with the thing. And I would suggest using that model involving all of those same folks and maybe some others um, to go through a similar exercise on this because you know it, it will be a cost factor to add these um, uh, requirements for new new structures i mean and, and somebody might not have an electric vehicle at that home for another 10 years you never know when it might happen depending on what the consumer or individual does and i'm sure the question will be raised is what if they're adding to the cap cost of housing and then put more requirements on them. But that's a robust discussion that I think we need to have with the business community on the community. Um, but open to any other thoughts or uh, comments, questions y'all might have. Yeah, and I'll just say, I think we'd be happy to engage our membership in that conversation. Um, I think it's going to look different from business to business, what they think on it. So we're happy to have that conversation. Would you introduce yourself to everyone, yes. by the way? Uh, I'm Bailey Vincent. I'm with the Charleston Metro Chamber managing our local government affairs. May I tell you, Wesley is on the line and he would like to comment. Oh, great. Hi, how are y'all? Thank you. Um, I just did want to comment on a couple of um, items as far as the, um, right. like the whole. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, like the Whole Foods charger um, and those other level two. Um, am I muted or unmuted? Can you hear me now? Am I coming through now? No. I think that's an important conversation to have because, you know, as we think about building infrastructure for anything, including mobility and storage, brought up something that really caught my ear, and that is you know, tourism. Right? Tourism is a huge industry for us. So as we think about putting infrastructure out there, publicly accessed infrastructure, Whole Foods is a natural place because they use that as a draw. It's like selling toilet paper below cost, put it in the aisle to get people in the store. Same with Whole Foods, right? Um, if we build public infrastructure for uh, electric vehicles, we want to make sure we're sending those electric vehicles in directions and in places that we naturally want them to be not other places. It's no different than a car in the center of the city. Do we want a bunch of public charging stations in the center of the port of the city? We don't because we need to safely say that as the council member downtown. That's not going to be popular. But if we can direct tourists into large public spaces and then move them into the city in home with public transit, then we can probably, through our infrastructure policy, 
influence mobility in and around large centers and get people on public transit. So I mean, I think it looks like it sort of goes hand in hand. Um, but, but clearly, I, I just the last two days drove 901.4 miles down I-95, and everywhere you stop, there are there are electric charges, there, right. and they are charging you to do it, and they're all full. I stopped in Baltimore at one o'clock in the morning on Tuesday morning, Monday night, and the EV charging station. So there's a lot of demand for in those corridors, and that's the tourism So anyway, I mean, I think we, I think, my, my perspective, and certainly the mayor and Kevin are about to say about this too, I think there's some stomach on city council for a policy that gets multifamily development on board early. I think you're going to have a lot harder time building into our zoning code a mandate for electric vehicle charging stations and single family construction. The market's going to dictate that. Um, and I think they'll build in the main capacity so people can do what you just talked about. But I think multifamily, I mean, we missed the boat a little bit on that rash of apartments that we've built we've already had. So I think there's a stomach for it. We've got public transit requirements on um, large scale developments and all that. So I, 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 I've been to, what Kevin has to say, but I think we've yeah, got a council that's ready for, ready for that. Yeah, I mean, one last piece. Um, Except for those that are really traveling, like you just talked about, Mike, the normal EV owner is probably only going to charge once a week. But um, we're not talking about charging every single day. Uh, but it's those individual tourists coming to town who really need to be charged so they can run around town and then charge to go home. So how long, you went from 20 to 80 percent, how long was that charge? How long did it take? How much, how much time did it? About 25, and a supercharger, about 25 minutes. Okay. So it, once you go from 80 to 100, it's called the stadium effect, which means like if you're at the stadium and they open the doors, but all the people in the back get slowed down so that from 80 to 100 would be another 25 minutes. And normally for me, when I charge at home, when I charge at home, uh, when I charge at home uh, I, I usually charge when I'm in the low place, and I charge normally to 80, and that's like four, it's four hours at home, because it's charging at 45 miles an hour, where some of the superchargers are charging at 400 miles an hour. For the travel miles an hour. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Probably unlikely anytime in the future, but 
I mean, you've probably left the Florence and seen the new Bucky's. I mean, it's the craziest thing you've ever seen. There's more charging stations there than there are EVs in the entire Florence County, I suspect. Right, Florence, Bucky's. Yeah, not, oh, you gotta go. You gotta, you gotta go to Bucky's. You missed it. Oh, yeah. Field trip. Field trip, Katie, for the next day. One of the same in August. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's based out of Texas, and, and one of the things they pride themselves on is they've got one more of everything that you need. Including. You never have to wait to plug in your car to get gas, to go to the restroom. Get chips. I mean, it's really something. But what they have that a lot of places, my states don't have, is area, right? They've got places to build all of that out. Uh, but it's it, that's the model of the future in those transportation pilot all over the place, right? Yeah. You, you you mentioned. I'm sorry. You mentioned bringing all the new apartments that like on Mars, and at one point they're going to be clamoring at a city council meeting where we're actually constructing. It's going to happen. Correct. All right. Um, so, is it the consensus that we would take this matter on? What would the chamber and other uh, in the business and development community and kind of gauge this um, issue and come back with a recommendation at our next meeting? Is it our planning department? Our planning department. Yeah. Okay. All that I would add is having just worked through the bill and lab issues. Um, to see if three months is sufficient. It takes a while to work through this. Building consensus is, is trippy and understanding positions is take some time. So um, try to be thoughtful. So um, have a safety valve for if not three months, um, six months. So that's all. Did we ever get? I think we might be able to get Westy now. Okay. Westy, if you want to try again. I know everyone online could hear him. Yeah, can y'all hear me now? Hey, there you are. <laughs> All right. Clay, technology works every now and then. So, um, no, I, I just wanted to comment on the uh, the question earlier on the, uh, like, the Whole Foods chargers, the the Level 2 network chargers. You can program those to, to charge a fee, or you can decide as a uh, retailer to um, to give it away for free, like Whole Foods is now, and then you can change it later on. So a lot of the model, even the Tesla model on the destination charging, is going towards a a uh, fee model for um, the site host to charge a fee to help recoup some of their investment. So. Yeah, Jeff, you problems as the single, the small, the thinner bags uh, that we're passing around here. So we went to other communities to see if they were facing the same problem. And we found an example in Barrington, Rhode Island, where they said, yeah, we have the same problem. This is how we fixed it. And what you see before you in this draft uh, code is how they fixed it, basically saying that changing the handles, that the handles would be stitched and not be fused and not solve the problem for the energy. So again, this is a really small, uh, it affects a very few businesses and they're the big box businesses that already have paper bags, they already have uh, everything ready, they've already dealt with this in other cities. Uh, we're, we're talking here about, you know, this is a Lowe's bag, that's a Walmart bag, so very few, but major impacts on these big businesses. 
So that is the first part of the ordinance. And then the second part is, is actually a way that businesses can save money. It, it really goes, we, we have cutlery exempt in our ordinance already, but it's basically saying only give me cutlery if, if I need it. Um, so it's a, it's a way of just, just asking, you know, in the drive through do you need this fork? Um, you know, if you've ever had like Uber Eats or DoorDash, they will deliver you silverware, napkins, everything to your home when you can simply check if you need this or not. And we have that all figured out. They've done it in other cities. So uh, those are the two minor amendments that could have a really big difference. So if I might go ahead and ask a question. With this modification, I'm presuming that the bag samples you have here before us today, that one and the one over there, would, would not qualify. Right, so this handle is, this handle is heat fused to the top. It is heat fused. So we don't want it to be. Where's the other bag? Okay. Is that one, is that one stitched? It's heat fused. That one's not stitched. Yeah. It's stitched on the top of the handle, it's not stitched. Oh, I see. It's just the very top is just melted together. Melted together. Those are our fans. Yeah. Okay. Questions, comments, thoughts about all that? Council Member Keeley. Thank you. Um, Katie, I know that when we mentioned this last time, we said we would reach out to other municipalities and try to get some of those on board with us on this. So, I mean, are, are they looking at it at all, or is there anything going on with the other municipalities? That's a great question. Uh, so, I've reached out to all the other municipalities. I've shared this with them. They are all considering it. They would like us to act on it first, and then they will take action. <laughs> <laughs> there is some true leadership. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Yes, I worry, I, I like get Chambers thought on this too, but I, I worry about the city of Charleston making it harder for businesses to do business than people who are not in the city. Um, you know, I represent part of West Ashley. It is not all city. There are donut holes all through there. We have businesses that choose every day. We have a business right now that's getting ready to start construction that chose not to be in the city that's getting ready to start construction. I just feel like we need the support of those other groups before we move forward on this because we don't need to be known as making it harder to do business in the city of Charleston. But once we get their support, then I think we ought to move this to council. But, um, but I mean, right now, the way it is, if somebody has a choice of being in the city or not, and this is one of many things on their list, when they make a list of pros and cons of where they want to be, we don't want to be ruled out because we make make business harder. That's probably a, a valid point, but I think there are other reasons why people might not want to be in the city. Uh, some of our um, issues regarding permitting and other things really makes it, in some people's minds, more difficult to be in the city. Um, when we first discussed this way back for sing, plastic, single-use plastic bags, we talked about the fact that we might not be the first, but we're going to be one of the first. We probably each might have been the first at that time. Um, I'm thinking of, we, we had people here from the aquarium, but we had other individuals that were here. They were talking about how, what a priority this is and how much plastic is just being thrown away. And I think we all know that the heavier plastic bags, which probably like liquor stores and other areas, places like that, people don't reuse them. And they're going into the into into the garbage. They're going into the landfill. Um, and we also have this in our climate action plan. I think we need to be proactive. People were concerned that single-use plastic bags would kill businesses. I remember even going to city council meeting and hearing certain council members do that. And Katie went out with a whole team, we went to various parts of the community, and gave presentations on why this is necessary. We, we grants, we got all of these alternative bags that are still in existence. I think we could do that. And I think it's probably more responsible for us 
as the city of Charleston with the first climate action plan in the entire state of South Carolina to be proactive. And I just want to add that, you know, this is a health issue. These things are ending up in our waterway, and we are ingesting plastic already. And the more we can keep this out of the waterway, the healthier we will be, the healthier all the animals will be. Um, and that, you know, who knows what this is doing to us and our bodies. Um, it's also, you know, a tourist issue. No one wants to come here and see a trash tree. So, you know, these things blow around there. So it's, there are a lot of reasons to do this. Jen, um, have any of the businesses been communicated with on um, the possible change to the ordinance or have they been able to offer any feedback? We uh, announced this publicly back in uh, our June meeting and we've honestly been talking about it ever since this issue occurred. I, every time I talk with them, uh, businesses that provide these, I've at least encouraged them to also provide paper as alternatives and I said, hey, we're working on this just so you know, this will probably change so you won't be able to use this in the future. But like I said, we're talking about less than five businesses that this affects. So it will be really easy to reach out to these businesses. To go drive across any bridge and look down at the harbor and see the white ring that's around it along through it's dramatic mm -hmm. how much plastic there is out there. It is if anyone has any question that we've got a lot of plastic in places it shouldn't be, that is the time to go look at it. Because it's every time it's, it's really something. But I think we probably need to all be on the same page talk to the chamber. I don't know what's the difference in cost of having a fuse as opposed to a stitched bag. I mean, you're gonna hear from a mass producer who's like, ah, it's double the cost for a bag. Well, the idea is they would switch to paper. Right. Uh, and paper would be cheaper. Gotcha. So, anyway, but then, of course, there's the financial cost. I, I think we just need to be on the same page to get this bill done after the day, get it shut down. All right. And let's, let's go to the bottom of a few uh, businesses that we know have those kinds of actions. Direct conversation with them, too. All right. I was going over time. I think we started a little while and we carried on a little while. But Anyone from the public like to make a comment? Do you mind coming and get the microphone? You have a lot of enough voice, Betsy. Thank you. Yeah. At least you get to talk to real people, not, not imaginary people. Right? Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Betsy LaFord, Senior Project Manager with the Coastal Conservation League. Lots of really exciting initiatives going on. Thank you all so much for your work. Just wanted to make one quick comment on the tree inventory. Um, that is something I look forward to learning more about and wanted to make the note that as an advocate, something I've been deeply concerned about over the years is the, the free level at which it seems that these variants and special exception requests are being handed out by the DPA to cut down grand and protected trees. So I think having this inventory and being able to point to that data to say, we only have a handful of elm trees left in the city, or whatever it might be. This tree has been serviced X number of times. It has X level of health. I think will help the board members on the DPA really understand the implications of granting these variances and special exceptions. That's a separate part of the tree issue that I would encourage you all to consider, maybe attend the city DPA be as shocked as I am at every single agenda. There's numerous requests for tree removals. Most of them are granted. Um, so looking forward to that inventory, and I think that will be a really helpful uh, part of the puzzle. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy. It's a big job. Yeah. It's a, 
All right, any other public comments? You good? I do have two comments that were submitted. Uh, oh, good. So this was submitted by Andrew Wunderly of Charleston Waterkeeper. Your committee member of Charleston Waterkeeper fully supports the proposed amendments to the city's environmentally acceptable packaging ordinance. Our community has spoken strongly on the impacts of single-use plastic pollution. The proposed amendments will be well to close the loophole that allows some to comply with the letter of the city's ordinance, but not the spirit. Thank you for taking action on this important issue. Second comment is from Emily Senso of the Coastal Conservation League. Your committee, the league, fully supports the city's work to amend the plastic bag ordinance to close the loophole in the extra big bags. It is clear that the businesses that have opted to use these bags rather than true reusable bags are large chain stores that can afford to ship the paper bags and true reusable bags. Our small businesses have done an excellent job of complying with the integrity of the ordinance. Given that it has been in place for years now, it seems to be an appropriate time to make the simple amendment using model language from other municipalities that have been successful. Please continue to rely on the League as a resource when and where we can be helpful in the city's efforts to reduce unnecessary waste. We applaud the city for continuing to be a leader in this area. All right, anything else uh, to come before us today? Um, hearing none, we stand adjourned. Thank you all for your participation in part of that.